so the clock has uh, struck uh, 11.40 and uh, this is my talk called Real Rebels Pay Their Taxes. So at my, at my company workplace, I, in February, I typed out the question in our company work chat and that was, I was asking is it ethical to invest time into learning and using technologies from companies that pay little or no taxes? And following that, we got into a really nice and interesting discussion at my workplace. And when I saw that NDC Oslo had a call for proposals, I submitted, I pitched the idea to uh, explore this question and uh, luckily they accepted it. So that's this the, that will be the this question is the core of this talk. So, but who are these companies I'm thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about the IT tech giants that li mostly live in uh, Silicon Valley, and uh, there are many ways to group them and uh, build acronym acronyms out of it. But it's for me, I want to focus on uh, these companies. And they do something which a lot of uh, multinational companies do. They do tax optimizations, which is ways to get away from paying tax. So, uh, so when everybody is doing it, uh, kind of. Um, then also, like for instance, Apple, they are currently fighting uh, the EU about uh, 14 billion euros in outstanding uh, tax because uh, for two decades, they were able to have 0, 0. 0. 0.005% uh, as low as that type of tax rate. But on the other side, these companies are super highly evaluated it's like enormous so it's i mean what what is even uh 1000 1.4 trillion dollars it's hard to know right uh but actually uh around the 1.2 trillion range then you're talking about world economies such as australia thailand egypt taiwan those type of countries so 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 that's that's the size of the the amount of money flowing through these companies, or the or not flowing through these companies, but how highly valued they are. So market capitalization, capitalization, that's the stock price times the number of stocks they have out. So so they 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 evade tax. They're super highly evaluated, uh, super highly evaluated, and also. They have uh, a lot of societal costs. Um, the project Dar Dragonfly uh, was or is a project to repurpose the search engine technology of Google to be to uh, to be sold to the censorship state of China. Amazon they will not confirm or deny if they have sold fa facial recognition technology to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, called ICE uh, in the U.S. and uh, so, but there are uh, definitive proof that they have been talking about selling uh, facial recognition software. And ICE, that is the um, uh, government group in the U.S. who are uh, really cracking down on illegal immigrants and separating parents from children. So Facebook, they. Uh, researchers uh, looked at the Rohingya crisis, where um, where they argue that uh, Facebook was a key enabler in uh, hate speech, which led to hundreds of thousands of uh, Rohingya people being uh, uh, chased, uh, made to made to flee. And then we have Cambridge Analytica, which uh, where um, where you see that Facebook could be used as a platform to influence uh, referendums or elections. We have Apple who is uh, really uh, fighting hard to avoid anybody else but them uh, fighting their uh, stuff, uh, 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 fixing uh, their products. So 
in a, in a time where we should, uh, in during the climate crisis, we should actually be fixing our things. But uh, this company is working hard against that. And finally, we have Microsoft, where uh, workers in Microsoft have um, protested internally and externally about their support uh, for ICE. So. Uh, to sum up, this is um, environment. I mean, uh, this is a. You can sum this up as an investment term called environmental, social, and governance. So this is uh, all these aspects. So these um, uh, these costs a given investment could have to society. So, but what about developers? What about us? Well, we spend a lot of our time, even our free time learning and contributing to these technologies. So then again, I ask, is it ethical to invest time into learning and using technologies from companies that pay little or no taxes? Who am I to judge, right? Who am I? Well, um, my name is uh, Nils Norman Hukos. I'm a user, uh, UX designer by education and a full stack developer by trade. I've been working in this industry for six years and I blog at Nils Nordot.no. And lately I've been doing something that I'm not very uh, uh, used to, which is writing a newspaper and uh, writing articles in regional and national newspapers about where I criticize Norway's current approach to the contact, contact tracing app, where I argue that it's like we're really uh, working towards mass becoming a mass surveillance state. So the last thing I was um, uh, invited to participate in was to, to contribute a little bit to a petition by industry experts. So I, I was by no means the person who started the petition, but I was able to make some contribution to that. And so we ended up being uh, uh, 50 uh, people from academia, from the industry, from the security uh, fields uh, who signed initially signed the petition. And now it's over 100 uh, peop hundreds of people actually. And also we're seeing that this type of political uh, pressure works but slowly. So uh, now you might be thinking, what does my workplace think about all of this? Well, actually my workplace loves this kind of stuff. So I work at the place where uh, we have no departments. Uh, we only have cross-functional teams. Uh, it's, uh, you could say it's typically Norwegian to try to have a, a very little hierarchy and organization. And we really love uh, the ability or cherish the value of being critical with each other, but also with the customer and also out in society. So during Christmas, we were all given this book by uh, Mike Montero, who's a famous designer. And um, it was a really eye-opening book uh, about where it, it gives a healthy criticism to the lot of the Silicon Valley tech giants. So, and... A fun fact, uh, the, pic, the, the text under the picture of the snake to the right there, it says, uh, this user is changing the world from the inside, uh, changing, changing a system from the inside. So you could give it, uh, that's a, kind of a hint of what that book is about. But let's return to our topic. So we have a question that we want to answer. And I've uh, created uh, five uh, chapters because I believe we have a lot of uh, content to cover. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff. So let's uh, first talk about rebels. No uh, tech talk would be complete without uh, some form of uh, word definition, and certainly not this one. So um, uh, the site, the site Merriam-Webster defines rebels as uh, um, to act in or show opposition or disobedience. That's the, the part I want to focus on and not taking up arms. So, so it's about uh, rebelling at something. And, uh, and to expand on that thinking about what a rebel is, I want to uh, point to um, a movie called uh, SLC Punk. Uh, let's see if I can just move my image a little bit. And then, whoops, I fell out of my talk. 
There we go, I'm back. <laughs> so, uh, this uh, movie, SLC Punk, and uh, so we're following a protagonist, and he's dyeing his hair blue, and he's rebelling against his parents, his society, and everything. And then he's like totally floored by a lady uh, at the party who asks, like, Why do you dress and dye your blue hair uh, uh, blue? Uh, dye your hair blue. That's not rebellion, that's fashion. And he's like totally floored about this. Okay, so what is rebellion then? Well, rebellion happens in the mind. It's not about uh, what you wear or uh, uh, how you look. And so what about developers? Well, we are certainly not immune to fashion. I just look at the stickers we have on all our uh, computers. And so we're not talking about uh, punks uh, who are very concerned about dressing up as uh, punks or rebels. We are talking about rebels who critique systems. So I argue that uh, to disobey any type of system, you need to understand what the system actually is. And uh, developers, we build systems. We, we love... Uh, doing architectures, uh, monolithic, service-oriented, microservices, serverless functions. So we, we build and we dream up these boxes and arrows and we, and we critique and figure out if this will work or not work. So, so, by, so this chapter, the point of this chapter is that I'm just trying to say it's okay to critique the systems of systems and also moving out and thinking about where does my system actually work and critique, critiquing that system. So we are trying to answer a question about ethics. And uh, but what even is ethics? It's a word we use a lot, but uh, let's look a little bit deeper. So ethics is the, um, it's a field of study that studies morality so it studies how you sh how how you should act how to evaluate a uh, person's acting the actions themselves and also the results of those actions what about morality well ethics studies morality and morality is divided by them into there are two broad forms or notions where one is descriptive so uh, what are our norms, values, and attitudes? And then we can move on to talking about what, but what about normative uh, morality? What norms should be be following or not following? And ethics is a broad and old type of study. There are tons of different theories here. But you can group uh, some of the ethical theories in uh, some three uh, broad uh, categories. So let's look at them in turn. So virtue ethics is simply asking, what would a virtuous person do? So they're saying like, we can't invent universal rules that will make people do the right thing in all situations. The world is too complex. So what we need to do instead is to develop uh, virtues and and then instill people with those virtues and then they will make the right choice. So you could think about teaching your child uh, about compassion, about justice, about courage, and then trusting that in any morally sensitive situation that they will make the right choice. So then you have uh, the ontology which is a rule-based approach to figuring out what's the right action. Uh, the most famous rule in this uh, category is uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, categorical imperative. And uh, so you should only act by the maxim that uh, at the same time you could will that it should become a universal law. So what does that mean in practice? Well, that means that if I cheat on my taxes, that means that I would want everybody else to also cheat on my taxes. So, and also if uh, if some uh, if uh, someone came to my door and they were looking for somebody I knew was hiding inside, and I knew that uh, I had to protect them, then I would lie. Uh, then maybe I would tell a lie because I'm thinking that everybody else in that situation should also tell a lie. Yeah. 
So this is the rule-based approach. Finally, we have consequentialism where they go all the way to the result and try to figure out, looking at the result, if it was a good action. And uh, the best outcomes, they that's discussed within this category and it's an old field even, it's called axiology. So, and the most common uh, theory within this category is utilitarianism. So, considering all actors to be of equal importance, what action would provide the most utility for everybody? So, you could think about the trolley problem. So, you could uh, think about uh, the, the classic trolley problem where a trolley is falling down a train line and you're standing and you can pull a lever to, to choose between if the trolley should hit a group of people or a one person. So this is, uh, you could say, a utilitarianism uh, conundrum uh, that you could answer with this theory. So then the, in, that the, in this world sense, the best outcome would actually clearly be uh, sacrificing one person over the many. Uh, so that's that theory. So returning to our question then, we have visited some of the the primary theories within ethics, what can we say? Well, companies are not persons, so we can't judge them by their virtues, or uh, we don't have a canonical virtuous person to look to, so it's hard uh, to, to say if that person would invest time or not. And then we have uh, the ontology. So that's like, uh, that's also, hard to figure out the rule here, so then uh, about whether or not you should invest time. Uh, so finally, so it's, it leaves us with utilitarianism to the best way to judge the impact of investing time or not investing time in these companies that pay no little, uh, uh, pay little or no taxes. So uh, but what is the value of taxes and what is the value of these companies? We, we can't answer this question without going deeper into those aspects. So let's talk about value. So this is a quote by Big Bill Haywood, who is the founder of the United States First Industrial Union. I'm going to read it out because I think it's so good. Um, the barbarous gold barons, they did not find the gold, they did not mine the gold, they did not mill the gold, but by some weird alchemy, all the gold belonged to them. So that is the opening, uh, or it's a um, quote that um, the professor in economics, Mariana Matsukato, uses uh, to kind of kick off her book on value. And she is saying like, um, she says that value over the centuries of economic thinking and research, uh, value was a hotly debated area, but today, we are, not, we are not really debating value anymore. And there are many reasons for that, which she, she explains in the book and we will cover here. So, and, um, so if, we, if we don't have a clear grasp of value, we don't know who is producing value. We don't know if uh, something, some activity is valuable. We don't know if it's contributing to economic growth. So let's have a quick overview of the, um, uh, how economics have developed over the centuries. So in the beginning, it was called the political economy and uh, some people, uh, and also the, the, maybe the, one of the first papers or books on uh, doing economy was actually called the political arithmetic. So they were trying to figure out what was the best way for the people running the state to do best to do to do uh, to increase the economy. So, in the 1600s, uh, we have we had a lot of uh, we had it's defined as the mercantilist period of thinkers, where they uh, valued uh, precious metals. So it was everything about uh, protectioning tra protecting trade routes, securing enough money to uh, to support the colonization of the world, and and having enough money to wage wars. So the these thinkers during that time they were trying to figure out can we afford a war, and they didn't have a lot of data at the time, but they were still starting to enable this idea of national bookkeeping. 
And then we have the physiocrats who reacted to the, the mercantilist thinking and they were saying like, no, value doesn't come from trade. Value comes from the soil. Value is humans don't create value. We transform it. And the primary uh, people uh, who was uh, creating value in society are the farmers. So this was in France during the, um, uh, the eight, 1800s, uh, 18th century. And in France, uh, the economists, they, they were also political. So they, they wanted to argue that uh, the, the people owning land, the farmers there, they were the true value creators. So they were tired of having um, uh, like uh, prices uh, artificially low on uh, goods. So they wanted to like kind of to support the foreign trade. So and yeah, so they developed theories about that to to support this world view about who are uh, producing value and who is not. Then we have the classical uh, thinkers who. Then now you, we're, uh, we're coming to the Adam Smith, uh, David Ricardo, Karl Marx, who in the time of uh, in the great industrialization of the world, they, they harnessed and developed on the theory by the physiocrats. And they talk about value coming from not only the farmers, but coming from uh, workers themselves. And then we have the neoclassicals, uh, reacting to the to the classicals, and they were saying like, and they they looked to the hard sciences such as physics, and they wanted to uh, talk about a system that automatically balances itself. So then we're no longer talking about value coming from uh, the workers; the value is coming from the system itself. But we will get back to classical and neoclassicals. So during the um, uh, all these periods, all these uh, thinkers, uh, economists, they were trying to figure out what are productive activities and what's unproductive. So this has everything to do with uh, when the state is trying to figure out, okay, what what do we need to put all our efforts in? Is it put efforts in banks, put efforts in farms? What is so? Th so this line of uh, they call it the production boundary. Uh, we yeah, this is. Uh, this is a great like mental image that economists uses and we will also use in our talk. Uh, interesting fun fact, or it was eye-opening for me, was that uh, economists did not consider banks as productive up until the 1960s. So they were only considered to be transferring wealth and uh, almost like a necessary evil. So, but that started to change in the 1970s when uh, nations uh, started calculating uh, the activities from the financial sector in the gross national product. So then in the gross national product is one of the key figures we have to figure out if a country is doing better or doing well. So suddenly banks could say like, yeah, we're contributing a lot to the economy. So now if you only would just easen up on the laws, we can do even more. So it, uh, it led to uh, less laws on that sector. Another concept we need to talk about is the concept of value extraction. So you have value creation and you have value extraction. So a lot of the economists they they are very they are very uh, hard on rent they are saying like you know rent that is stuff you earn from owning things it's not from uh, it's not value creation a lot of the economists say this so it's it's because you have access to some land or a brand or something like that uh, some piece of patent that you're renting out so, and you're not uh, creating value, you're just redistributing wealth and you're redistributing it to yourself mostly. So, and then we have this concept of rent seeking, which is the act of trying to figure out ways to get the rent, uh, rent on uh, things. So this is what Mariana Masucato has to say about uh, platforms. So, uh, Claiming value in innovation most recently with the concept of platforms and the related notion of the sharing economy is less about genuine innovation and more to do with facilitating value extraction through the capture of rents. So that's something to think about and we'll 
uh, return to that. So I promised you we would talk a bit about more about classical narrative, and that's the the classical way of looking at the world, which is that value is generated by the time spent working on something. And then uh, workers working, they will generate some surplus, which owners of the factory, they will be able to get from themselves. And so this thinking with Adam Smith, David Ricardo, Karl Marx, it was happening in a time with great inequality. And this was a very solid, well uh, discussed theory that was becoming more and more uncomfortable for the for the people running the show because here we have a theory that is clearly saying like the workers are building value uh the owners of the factory what are they doing uh, yeah so it became very so something needed to happen so then enters this neoclassical narrative and during this period Economists stopped saying that they were a political economy because they wanted to be more like a hard science inspired by physics. So then they invented concepts such as marginal utility, which is that um, I'm paying so and so much for this thing because I need it. It has so and so much marginal utility for me. The less I need it, the less I'll pay. Uh, so that, that's the argument, so it goes, where you have a lot of art actors in the society and they want stuff, they trade stuff, and pe every, nobody is willing to pay more than they want. So then, uh, and then this, uh, so the value of something is determined by the price people are willing to pay. So this uh, neatly removes the concept of workers or worker labor uh, power from the equation of value. And uh, the, they continue on to develop this whole idea about market equilibrium. If only the state is uh, uh, like uh, kept back, don't do that much. As long as you have a free market, the market will figure out itself. So, and also the concept of unearned income disappears because then if somebody pays me a lot of money, they wouldn't pay me more than uh, they, they could due to or more than they wanted due to marginal utility concepts. So in this worldview, everything everybody earns is the just price they should be earning. And uh, Mariana, she points out that this has a lot of problems. So we are now we with the, the reigning economic theory or understanding of value, we are actually trapped in circular logic. So we have life-saving medicine that's expensive because it's valuable because people pay rather than dying. That's also called value-based pricing. So yeah, and as I mentioned, uh, all income is deserved and it determines the value of it. And finally, to close off this section is that how we talk about value matters. And Mariana doesn't want to deliver, uh, Masukato doesn't want to deliver the definitive answer here in her book, but she wants to like return the, the concept of value to be a, a, a debated uh, discussion. What about taxes? Well, uh, what better way to start off than uh, showing a picture of this guy who is uh, Ruth, Rutger Bregman? Historian last year, he uh, took a plane to uh, Davos, uh, the Davos conference, where a lot of the richest people in the world gather. And uh, so he was surrounded by billionaires and they asked him a question and he he chose to ignore that question because he had something else he wanted to say. And he's like, Texas, 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 all the rest is bullshit in my opinion. And um, so he argues that uh, we shouldn't wait for billionaires to do more. And history shows us that periods of high taxation has been great for the economy. On the flip side, the billionaires, they, they live under this story. If only we don't, we don't do wealth tax, they will help the private sector in ways that, uh, or they will help the private and the government sectors in the ways others cannot. And then Huffington Post, they did a real interesting article two months into the coronavirus outbreak where they looked at the 50 richest billionaires in the US and they like, so what have they done? 
well, actually, very, very little. So then they're saying uh, COVID-19 is actually a great case for wealth tax. But now you're thinking, but isn't tax bad? Well, tax, tax and taxpayers, they, uh, they help fund key innovations such as the internet and new medicines. So then when a pharmaceutical company, they uh, publish uh, new medicine, they are, they are very often building upon millions and millions worth of taxpayer money in form of uh, basic research. And she's like saying that not only do um, governments innovate, she says that uh, governments can shape markets, not just intervene. So you could, a small example of that would be the, the, the country of Sweden who lowered the, the, the VAT, uh, the VAT tax, the value added tax on repairs. So then you're shaping the market to suddenly making uh, repairing and taking care of your stuff more valuable over time. And another reason we need to talk about tax is that Wealth is power, and for that we need to look to uh, the economist Thomas Piketty, and he's saying that you can work your whole life, and you you get a lot of money from that working your whole life, right? But uh, if you compare that to somebody who in, started out in life with uh, inherited money, your your type of your amount of wealth will be insignificant. It will not mean anything. So, and also if you have a lot of money, that is power and he provides this historical overview where he's saying like after the second world war, we had capitalism, we had equality in the world uh, with those things combined, but that was a time of great, uh, very special circumstances. So that, so then you had equality, but now we see inequality skyrocketing. And he argues actually that we should not only tax more, we should actually start confiscating wealth, which is quite strong words for an economist. So what about me? Uh, let's move on to some tax bills. Well, I paid $23,000 in tax in uh, 2018, and uh, I was able to fund uh, welfare, education, and government. Contrast that to, the, to Amazon, who paid uh, zero dollars in federal income tax in 2018. So they and they outcompete smaller tax-paying businesses on a global scale. So not only are they not paying tax, they're ensuring that less, uh, fewer other companies are paying tax, and they're but they're creating a lot of uh, jobs. Well, those jobs are low-income jobs, and they they extract profit to the business. So imagine competing with companies that don't pay tax. So they can do crazy things like they can reinvest all that money straight back into the product, making it better. They can use money to boost stock prices by share buybacks. That means that, so that for instance, Amazon does this. They, they, buy, uh, they buy their own stock uh, and they say that this is to increase uh, share max, uh, cre increasing shareholder value. So they, they have these huge cash reserves by not paying tax, which they can use uh, in a number of ways. So if I, or I had a coffee shop uh, somewhere and I saw that the Starbucks opened up across the street, then I could be sure that uh, that Starbucks could not have a customer for many, many years and still be okay because these multinational companies have so much money to spend. So we have looked at uh, a lot of topics so far. Um, I ho I'm happy that you're staying with me so far. Um, what, was, what, what was the point of all of this? Well, we have this question, right? So is it ethical to invest time into learning and using technologies from companies that pay little or no tax. We have a better grasp about ethics, uh, taxes, and um, value itself. And to answer this question, I'm, I'm going to argue no based on everything that I've presented so far. So tax evasion is a toll on society. We, we justify it by a circular reasoning of value, and you, we can't ethically justify it even with 
utilitarianism, yeah, I argue. And now maybe you're sitting at home and thinking like, great, uh, we're going to just move out of our cloud kingdoms where we finally achieved the planet scale technologies. And now we're just going to move out into the cabins and, uh, and write everything uh, from the start again. Well, no, I'm, I'm not arguing that, but I want us to start the discussion here. And, and also you might be asking like, what, what's wrong with using React? Well, what's wrong with using that? Well, so just let's look at what it means to use React. Well, developers, we write free codes, we write free tutorials, we innovate, and ultimately we ensure that everything else in the world works with React. We lower the barrier to entry, and so we expand the market. And also this builds up a talent pool who looks up to them. So then I mean, uh, that that means a lot of developers look up to Facebook because of React. And we could say the same thing about uh, Swift, about GitHub Actions. We could say that about Kubernetes. We could say that about VS Code. So, but there, it's all free, right? Uh, well, I'm, I want to, to that, I want to say, beware the free hammers. So we have a saying in the developer world where if you have a hammer, uh, like developers with hammers will try to use it everywhere. And we do. So we, uh, we use it everywhere. We, we try to make it do anything. And uh, when, use, when we're using that hammer, for instance, React, we will try to improve it and we blog about it. We will tell a friend about it. And, and now you might be thinking, but is this still bad? Well, we need to think about the alternative cost here. So the, the time we spend in our free time uh, improving a technology from tax evading companies, that is time we're not spent spending on doing something else. And we only have so much hours in ourselves, right? It's actually a great privilege to be able to work on uh, open source in your free time. Not everybody has the time to do it. So let's talk more about value. So we need to think about what gives value in 10 or 20 years. Think about a children's book, a good children's book that uh, maybe it influences some children and it results in maybe 10 or 20 or 30 well-rounded adults that do good in society. So the, the children's book was had a cheap price, but the value was actually much greater. And, uh, and another thing that was had surprise, surprising value was the platform Neopets. So um, if you listen to any type of podcast, uh, talking with the web designers and developers, and they talk about how they got into web development, I've noticed that a lot of people are saying that, yeah, I was just playing around in Neopets. So the, um, there's a link there on the Neopets uh, name there to an article about um, interviewing uh, young girls who were uh, growing up with Neopets and later would go into uh, web development. And then we have these other technologies. So what is the lifetime value of uh, spending a lot of time on AMP, uh, Google's AMP or React or Kubernetes? Well, it's hard to answer right now, but let's look at history here. Let's look at the history of around uh, 2003. So this is uh, Tante Selik. Uh, he's talking about uh, how the web was in 2003. And it was like, it was pretty rad actually. Uh, by uh, going around on a South by Southwest conference, everybody was greeting each other by the domain name. Everybody had their own little site where they had blog roles talking about other blogs and they were following each other with RSS. So it was kind of maybe it was peak uh, independent web and it was a very interesting time. But what happened? Well, uh, social silos happened and they lowered barrier to entry. So it was much easier to create a Facebook account rather than uh, um, trying to set up your own site. And they would then go on to innovate on addictive design that would ensure that users kept coming back to, for more. And 
And also another thing that I want to point out is that they made it impossible to accidentally learn HTML and CSS like the, the young girls did with Neopets. So now, um, so maybe so now we have we have a situation where people are vendor locked in by friends. They are experiencing dark UX and they don't have any web development knowledge and they're buried in advertisements. Uh, someone I know they said like maybe the or um, I hear somewhere that it wasn't uh, nicely pointed out where maybe the greatest trick we did was to lure all our friends and family into Facebook and then we just leave. So, but people are trying to do something about this, right? So in the corners of the web, we have a lot of initiatives that are trying to make build uh, accessible alternatives. So I just wanted to mention that uh, before we go on to talking about the main talk here, which is like, so let's so let's evaluating our time investments here. So the these technologies on the left here, they they those are the type of like learn once, use forever. But then on the other side here, we have this learn once, recreate ecosystems forever. So this is something I've seen over the many years of my experience. I see uh, maybe Angular being a thing for a while, and a lot of people they they build and write articles, they work on it, and suddenly React is a thing, and then everybody is flocking to React, and they we're, we're working on making React a thing. We're we're creating plugins, we're working to, working to make it work, and and then and it's the same with all of these others. Um, uh, these other plugins. So, and and even between versions. So between uh, maybe Grunt or Gulp or a Webpack. Maybe maybe between a major version. Then it's like okay, everybody, let's scramble to update our plugins. Of course, you can say if everybody does it well, then there's no extra work for people. But still, we are we are. I want to say we are wasting a lot of time inventing framework syntax for each other here. And, and what for? Is it to save each other from learning HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and system administration? So we're making it easier and easier to use these technologies, which I argue are dead ends. So what should we do? Well, I, I, I'm. Everybody is experimenting and trying to figure out how uh, open source can be made sustainable. So what I'm trying to work with now is I want to dual license my code with uh, this very strict copyleft license called HGPL V3, and then if somebody wants to use it for uh, in a way that they don't want to release the source code, uh, their source code, then they could. Pay me a uh, pay me for a commercial license, so I don't I don't need this to survive. But it's just kind of um, it's it's a political statement. Uh, I don't want to see uh, open source maintainers burn out. So and and this stuff has a lot of value. So and Amazon has a lot of mon Amazon and Google and Apple. They have a lot of money to spare clearly, so they can pay me for a commercial license if they want to. Well and. I want us to invest in vanilla JavaScript and web components. Web components aren't uh, super smooth as uh, React have become, for instance, but if we use it, it will be great. It's like developers, we, we scratch an itch and we make it awesome. And uh, another point is that I want us to uh, I want to say that we want we should build libraries and not frameworks. So here's a link to an article by somebody else. Uh, so it's not an uh, invention in my mind, but I really it really resonates me with me because frameworks they impose a worldview uh, that you need to like fit your code inside. And and when when the framework changes underneath you, then you just need to follow. So then and and you need to follow and follow and follow, and maybe the the framework gains uh, venture capitalist funding, and suddenly it's really changing a lot. So we we should like sidestep that, and instead spend time on building interchangeable libraries. 
So if we just build with van uh, vanilla JavaScript, we will increase the and and build it as libraries. We we can increase the longevity of JavaScript by an incredible amount. Like we are still keeping the blink tag around in browsers. So if you build stuff uh, with this in mind, with longevity in mind, uh, build JavaScript with longevity in mind, it can s stick around for a long time. And finally. We need to think web citizens and not users. If this sounds a bit weird to you, but uh, it's it's because I I want the the web citizen the the, the web citizen where uh, I mean I'm, I w I want it to be a bit uncomfortable because it, this is web citizens is uncomfortable because uncomfortable because it means that suddenly your users have a say in uh, what you're building and how you're building it. And uh, I think we should start including more users, uh, actual users or web citizens in the conversations about the technologies that we're building. So that's what we can do. Um, zooming out a bit, we can make uh, on a company or a societal level, we, can, we need to start evaluating the environmental pick, uh, impact of uh, all the digital stuff that we're building. So here's a book recommendation by a thinker named uh, Jerry McGovern, where he um, it's very recently published and and he argues very hardly for um, like the, there's a definitive cost to all the data centers and the, all the data we're shipping around and we need to start thinking about that. So in at my workplace we've had workshops about this and we are actually reevaluating the whole production pipeline. We are thinking about the way we write code and we're thinking about where we put the code. And uh, we have leadership buy-in um, for moving our service to 100% renewable energy. So that's what's happening in NetLife. So uh, this is the final slide. And I want to say that let's not wait for the market to fix itself. And so now I've shared a lot of um, uh, thoughts of from uh, talked a lot about uh, the ethics, value, taxes, and technology. And we vote with our feet when we choose to invest our free time, our labor into learning one technology over the other. So think about that vote. So. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, I'm, I think I'm going to be around in the uh, Slack channel. Uh, um, yeah, I'll be around in the, 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 I think it's the Conference 6 Slack channel. I'll start a thread there. So thank you so much for your time.